Each of us has a light that's been put in us, not meant to shine that light, but to share our light. Welcome to Share Your Light, where we have candid conversations with individuals who have overcome tremendous hardship and adversity in their journey through life. Today, we have Olympic bronze medalist Kelly Wells Brinkley here to share her journey through adversity and grief. Remember to go ahead and share this video with someone who can benefit and subscribe to our channel for more. Coaches spend the most time out of anybody with kids. Like they spend 45 minutes a day with each teacher. Um, they spend probably, you know, less than an hour with their parents when they get home from practice and the parents get home from work. But as a coach, I spend almost three hours a day with my kids, an hour in the athletic period and two hours of practice every day. So during that time, those relationships have to be cultivated and we have to realize that that's a lot of time that we could spend in between reps or you know, talking to kids, helping them to understand who they are and that they are cared for. You know, when you talked about having male coaches only, how did that affect your ability to, I guess, form that trust or open up about something as serious as issues that were going on at home? Like as a as an athletic community, do we need to do a better job of making sure that there's a trusted female available for everybody, even if they're not the head coach? Yes, I do think that um, you know there needs to be more female coaches in athletics for sure, um, and I feel like she needs to make her voice be heard on the team because I definitely remember having like assistant coaches here or there that were like female. Um, but not even in high school, maybe like the distance coach, but I didn't run distance. So like that didn't help me none. Um, but I feel like, yes, we do need to have more like female coaches present, female something present, because if you coach men and women and you're the head coach and you're a man, half of your team is girls and they're going through things that you can't even relate to. Even if you have a daughter and a wife, there's just stuff that my body goes through that my mind goes through that a man will never experience and then you talked about having the um feelings about resisting authority from male authority so that's another barrier that was in the way of you opening up to a male i would say yeah but then on the flip side of that for the longest time most of my closest friends were males but it was yeah. just about like an authoritarian, like someone telling me what to do or being forceful with things or like just not letting, or like me feeling like someone wasn't letting me be me or be free. Just feel the pressure to yell and be forceful to get their point across. I mean, I do it sometimes, but not all the time. You need to be yelled at like sometimes, like just to get their stuff together, obviously. Yeah. Um, I, in college, I had a female assistant coach and she came in trying to do too much and be too tough. And we ran her off. Cause I was like, and I was the president of run her off club. Cause I was like, who does it? Uh -uh. Like, I don't do like, I'm better now. Um, but like, I guess now I don't really have authority. So I'm like, but um, yeah, no, I definitely don't, I didn't enjoy that or just someone, I felt like people were trying to like put me in boxes and I had been in a cage for so long that like, no, nah, it's not happening. I don't, I don't know what kind of party you think this is. It's not that one. Did you have a problem with loving yourself ever? For a long time. Um, I didn't even know what that was. Like, I didn't even know what loving myself was or enjoying myself or enjoying my own company. Uh, so I had to take a long time to like learn that. Um, and there were like many layers to the loving myself thing uh, because I grew up and I went to school with majority white people. So I already didn't look like the other people look or what conventional beauty was, or you know what the guys thought was pretty. So I didn't feel pretty, because I'm like, but I like him, but he like Sarah. So what? what is it? Um, so I had to learn, you know, and then I went to HBCU and then that all changed because like, 
I had never seen that many brown and black people. And I'm like, what? Like we're celebrated? Like they actually like this? So that helped me a lot to learn to love myself as a black woman, um, learning about myself, learning about my culture. Cause in school, they don't like you get what a couple lessons of black history month in February. And then, you know, you move on. So when you're actually immersed in your own culture and I was like, Oh, so I'm really popping. <laughs> oh, why didn't anybody say this? Um, but it took a, it took a while to get there. And even, even past loving myself was appreciating myself and n not putting myself in places or around people that didn't appreciate me. Did you allow yourself to be taken for granted? All the time. Uh, yeah, friendships, relationships, um, even going into my adulthood. That was something that I had a struggle with of like being, or, and I don't even say like being taken advantage of, or, cause I mean, I was complicit, but I, I just didn't know better. Right. And it wasn't until probably after your counseling that you recognized it? Yeah, like that was like my second round of counseling too. Because I thought like for the first couple sessions, I was like magically fixed. And I didn't know I'm like, oh, you have to keep going to counseling. Oh, okay. Oh, so you went a few times and then you just stopped? Yeah. I yeah. went maybe four or five times. And I was like, okay, I'm fine. I'm good now. I'm fixed. Yeah, I was just talking to somebody the other day who had like a traumatic experience in high school. It was an assault. And she went to like four sessions and I didn't realize that was all she went to. She was like, yeah, I went to four sessions. Okay. And I'm like, that's not enough, babe. Yeah, you're like, no, I feel so much better. Like I talked about it. I feel better. You're not knowing that like, sis, that's the tip of the iceberg. Like that is, yes, you talked about it, but there are lots of other things that are now, you know, cracked up and affected because of you know, certain things that happened to us. I have another athlete I talked to who witnessed abuse at home um, and just a toxic relationship between their parents. And you mentioned that with your dad and your mom, well, twice, with your dad and your mom and your stepdad and your mom. How did that affect you emotionally? Um, it made me very despondent to people. And then also, like, I have a I have like some people got the attachment issue and I have the complete opposite of like detachment of like, Oh, mm -mm, nope. like, Oh, we dated for two years. That's fine. I don't even know who you are tomorrow. Like that's fine. Um, so my switch is very easily like switched off. Um, and I know that's also not healthy. So that's something that I've also worked on and, um, just gone through because yeah, I would, I would, I could attach myself quickly, but also like in 48 hours, you would be cleared from my life. And I just, um, that is something that took a lot for me just because if I, if I ever felt like threatened or just treated like in a way that I thought was especially like dangerous to me. Um, and it could be like simple stuff is like yelling. Like I don't do arguing. I don't do any of that. Um, so it would be very easy for me to be like, mm right what who are you <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh i don't know kelly you've been through so much in your life and you are still standing it's kind of inspiring you know just that a person can experience these things and find a way through because some people feel like when they're going through it all they can see is the clouds. All they can see is where they are. All they can see is the torrential downpour, but they don't see that perhaps, you know, the sun won't shine the way that it did before, but there will be sunshine on the other edge of this. And I'm talking for myself right now. Sometimes I wonder, you know, like, how am I going to get through what I'm, what I'm feeling right now? Um, but it's really good to see someone able to smile, you know, even after what they've experienced. Let's talk about grief a little bit. You know, I think that, you know, even aside from the athletes, because we've touched a few times on just people in general, there are people who are going through COVID-19 right now and or going through just loss in general with the quarantine, like myself, my son passed away before this started, but being in the house, is just so difficult. 
it's so difficult. I felt like I was kind of making progress and now I don't, you know, mm -hmm. I feel stuck. How did you make it through the grief of losing your mom? Track, like a hundred percent, um, nothing but track. I can say that wholeheartedly. I ran my way through grief. I ran away from the grief. Um, so I didn't deal with a lot of grief until later on. Um, and I still deal with it in waves a lot. Um, it hit me again really hard when I had my son, um, he's four. It hit me really hard then because I realized I didn't know much about like raising a child because I wasn't raised, I just grew up. And I think that, that there's a huge difference in that. Um, like between someone lovingly raising you and then you just, you wake up and you're 18, you wake up and you're 20. Um, so that was a struggle of like, you know, I got this little baby, it's crying, I don't really know what it's like. I'm like, you're fed, you're not, you know, you're not wet, you're wrapped up. So like, what is it? And, you know, just dealing with stuff that like you're supposed to call your mom for. Um, it really, like, that was a hard time for me. Um, even now, it's like, as he's growing up, and I'm like, what's wrong with him? Is this normal? Like, what? And stuff like your conversations that you're supposed to have with your mom. Like, I just wasn't able to have them. Like, I don't know if I was breastfed, you know? So when I was dealing, going with, going through that, like, you know, I could call my aunt. Her and I are close, but it's not your mom. Right, right. And is that your aunt? From your father's side or your mom's side? My mom's side. Your mom's yeah. side. Yeah, they were like super close. Um, so yeah, like I dealt with grief and I feel like it probably will always be that way that like there will be things that are triggering that will make me think of her and miss her more than like other time period of just regular missing her. Right. So when track was over, um, when you were done running track, how did that impact you? I know for my husband, when his football career ended, it's like he almost went through this phase. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I've been present for the phase. <laughs> um, I really didn't have that because um, not a lot of people know this. So right when I crossed the line in 2012, I got a bronze. I knew I was done. I knew really? I was done. Yeah, I ran for three years after that. Um, but I knew like it, my whole outlook had just changed on it. Um, I was ready to do something else. I was ready to like stop sacrificing my entire life for the sport of like, I was like, okay, I did it. And people were like, you never wanted to go back for the gold. I literally never had that feeling. I was always like, hmm. My bronze feels like the gold. I feel like I came from, you know, went through so much and came from like depths and, you know, I went to a small HBCU my senior year. I didn't even make the NCAA final to like being the third best hurdler ever. And like we broke so many records and like, no, I'm fine. I'm good. Let's, I'm ready to get married and have a baby and move on and not be stuck in you know, a hotel in some obscure city with no Wi-Fi and no food pass. It was kind of like you had set a goal to get a, maybe become an Olympian, get a medal. You done it, you did it, so. So I ran because, I mean, it was my job and I mean, it was <laughs> great money and I got to do cool things, but my heart wasn't in it the same. Um, so when I retired, um, it, so it was a transition because then I was like, oh God, like, well, what am I going to do now? Like, this is what I've done for like 10 years. This is my daily schedule is, you know, all different now. And then I got, then I was actually pregnant. So I was like, oh, well, <laughs> now I have something to do. Yeah. Had you ever experienced depression while you were running? Um, depression? No. Anxiety? Yes. So like anxiety related to performances as well? Would you ever freeze up or have panic attacks? 
No, um, I would definitely never freeze up. I'm a performer. Really? I'm a performer. That's one thing that I'm always, I'll show up. And then I'm also really, really good at putting on a mask. Um, and that's something that I'm working through now in, in therapy of like, not wearing the mask and showing ev that everything's okay or like you could look at me and never know that like something is wrong or that i've been through stuff so i'm working on like keeping the mask off and taking it or taking it off and keeping it off um but no i was a performer i always showed up um i, I loved that was my favorite part like competitions um but i would have anxiety with like the coach that i was training with he induced anxiety in us a lot it was <laughs> love him but mm. um and then also of just like the uncertainty of things like track is uncertain a lot um and it's the one thing that i do like that it is depicted upon your performance but i mean there's always uncertainty especially like when i was younger in the sport um and i was just coming on and getting good like it was just so much anxiety that was in track um that i dealt with and then i mean there's always the anxiety of like making the team anxiety of getting on the podium anxiety of you know redu reduction of contracts and you, you've got this money planned out for this but they could cut you by 25 percent just because you know they feel like it so there's just there's always the worry because there's the business side of the sport right right wow well, I, I truly appreciate you sharing your story, your strength. Um, I hope that you take that mask off and keep it off. I'm working on that myself, you know, but I think that's a societal issue. It's just this way of people make us feel that we have to put on that mask for them. You know, be strong, they tell you, you know, you can make it through this. And they tell you all these things. I feel like all the motivational quotes that people say, you know, and I see it on social media right now, even through this pandemic, everybody's always saying something motivational as if to negate what we're feeling. Like just because you say a mo motivational quote, it's gonna take away what I'm feeling, but it doesn't change how I feel. I still feel what I feel and I should be allowed to feel what I feel without feeling guilty about it. I feel your feelings. Like that is the healthiest thing that you can do. And then I also think about like, whenever I get a chance to, you know, come on a podcast, share my story, um, talk about all the things that I've been through. Um, it's one of the reasons I don't love like women's empowerment conferences or whatever, because you get these uber successful women. And I've been one of the women that set up on that stage and I felt like fake because healing isn't pretty. It's not like earning a six figure con, you know, contract or you know, this is what I make. I'm a millionaire now, so I'm all fixed. No, that is not the pinnacle of like happiness and health and all of that. So I, I talk more like my success is like, I'm at a stable point in life. I'm, I'm healthy. I don't have, you know, suicidal thoughts. I don't, you know, like I, I'm healthy. And yes, I mean, of course I make a good living. That's fine. But I know plenty of people that have lots of money that jump off bridges too. So as a society, I think that we've got to look at more things than just, you know, how much money someone has. Yes, it helps. And of course, no one wants to be poor. But when we, when I see these quotes and these, you know, be supportive and be, you know, positive and look at the bright side. No, some days I'm going to look at the bad side of it and leave me alone and don't make me feel bad for that but also help me foster that healing of give me an ear that I can talk about. Like today is not a great day out of a 10. It's a two. I'm looking at all these negatives. And then if I say the same thing tomorrow, then you might get to check me. But if I'm feeling this at a certain moment, don't diminish how I feel. Don't make me feel insignificant when I know everybody has bad days. Right. And you have every right to, to, to feel that, to, to have a bad day. You know, it's different if you never experienced any hardship at all and you're complaining. That's one thing. But to have experienced things and to, to feel what you're feeling and try to make it through and not want to put on a mask for others, you should definitely be afforded that opportunity and have people that are there for you um, that allow that.
and that can say, hey, I can sit here through this pain with you. I love you enough to sit here through this with you, no matter how uncomfortable it is, rather than disappear. So many people went ghost on me after, um, you know, I just didn't snap back to being the person they wanted me to be or the happy person or the motivated person. I just was in a funk. Person that they could dump on. That like, oh, so I'm having a bad day or I, this is happening or my man ain't acting right or this or this or this. Like, I like, okay, so now I'm not that person for you. So now you have no use for me. Because I've experienced that of like, if I'm going through something, like I can't take on yours as well. So I have a philosophy, like if I call my friend and I'm like, hey, do you have five minutes for me? They know that I'm calling to talk about something. And if they're like, hey, no, I'll call you back. Then fine, you don't, you don't have the mental or emotional capacity to like deal with it. Or, you know, do you have time to receive this? Like, I feel like we've got to be more courteous because everybody's going through something and we have to stop trauma comparing. Like, just because I went through something, it may not have been something that you've gone through, but you've gone through something that is traumatic to you. And I may feel like your stuff is trivial. Like, your mom may buy you no Iversons. That's nothing. But it may have hit you in a way that's connected to something else. So we've got to stop, like, trauma comparing and know that everybody has been through something. Something has happened to them. And we got to allow people to just be them. Right. And we have to pick up that phone. And when we are in a space, give that five minutes to a friend or pick up the phone and call them. I've seen people posting like every, you know, people are posting on social media so much like trivial things and, and challenges, but then they want to post, oh, I, if I haven't told you, I love you, but that's not telling me that you love me by posting it on social media to everybody. I feel like we have to make time to be there for people. We get so caught up in just living a life, you know, living life day to day and enjoying life that we don't take time to realize that somebody might really be struggling. And then if that same person ended up passing away, then we're going to want to say stuff at their funeral that we haven't even taken the time to say while they can actually hear it. Right. Yeah. I saw one that it, it infuriated me and I tried to close my computer. Like if I, you have, if you haven't checked on me during the pandemic, don't check on me after. Really? Like, so this is about you. Like, you don't know what somebody else is dealing with at home. Somebody could be getting their head knocked into the wall. Somebody, like, you don't know what people are going through. So that's such a narcissistic comment to make of like, so the pandemic is about everybody calling you to check on you. Like, how many have you called to check on? I don't, I don't like, I don't like that. <laughs> So I'm, I'm, mm -mm. Like, yeah. I'm not, nope. Close laptop. Cannot. Yeah. I know. Have Have you ever? You mentioned earlier a little bit suicidal thoughts. Have you ever had those? No. Okay. Yeah. I know. Um, people do have them, and they're like it could be a passing thought, but so many people do have them, and that is that is scary. It is scary. It is scary. And there's so many people right now, athletes, adults, who when they're trapped in the house, and I keep saying trapped, they can go out. Okay, we can go outside. But when you, the majority of your day is spent inside these four walls versus the distractions that you have to stop the thoughts from racing in your mind, um, it is a scary place to be. It is a scary place to be, especially when you're still in the midst of a hurricane, in the midst of a storm in the midst of the trauma that you're trying to recover from. So, yeah, I surely appreciate you. Um, if there's one last thing you wanna say to anybody out there that's struggling uh, with recovering from trauma, they were making progress and then boom, everything was upended for them, what would you say? Um, I would say that keep going forward, left foot, right foot. Um, don't be afraid to feel those feelings reach out to somebody, even if it's a therapist over the phone, if it's your friend. Um, but I just feel like therapy is the key because they are trained professionals. They know to listen to trigger words. They know how to help you define what triggers you. Um, but you will always have relapses in your emotions and don't run away from that. Like, don't think that there's something wrong with you, that there's something different 
there are things that the wind could blow to the west and it will trigger an emotion in you and you will have a flashback or a feeling and that is okay because you didn't do anything to yourself you didn't harm you you didn't damage you it is not your fault so don't feel like you have to walk around with that backpack by yourself because it's just going to weigh you down so if you have if you feel like you're on a great path you're still on a great path there's just a little bump in the path nobody's path is smooth ever so don't feel like there's something wrong with you keep going keep going forward fight for your own happiness because there aren't a lot of people around you that will help you fight for that and don't think that there's something wrong with you because there's nothing wrong with you wow thank you thank you and thank you for those affirmations at the end those always help me it's not my fault I didn't, you know, cause this, I didn't do this to myself, you know, so those things are definitely, definitely helpful statements to remind ourselves when, when those thoughts continue to plague our minds. I appreciate you so much for joining us, Kelly. Um, your spirit has always been so infectious, even when you won your, your bronze medal. I remember you dancing, you know, <laughs> with the flag. It was so infectious and I just felt the joy, the pure joy that you felt in that moment so thank you for always being authentic in you and for letting us truly see who you are thank and you so much this platform i think that it's going to help so many people and i'm just very very proud of you super proud of you thank you it's hard but i'm fighting through i'm fighting through i mean both of i get hurdles too so i feel like life has always been a hurdle you know and this is another hurdle that i'm trying to find my way my way over you know? Yep. You'll do it though. Thank you. Remember to subscribe to our channel and click the bell for notifications. Share this video with someone else who can benefit. And thank you for tuning in to share your light.